today we'll discuss about traumatic injuries so the dental trauma injuries can manifest in many forms but cracked and chipped teeth are most commonly seen if you see what is the etiology of this traumatic injury is that it may be due to the automobile injury battered child child abuse or it may be due to drug abuse or epilepsy or falling from the height and the sports related injuries the most risk factors risk is higher in case of the angles class 2 division 1 malocclusion with the predisposing factors are high overjet protrusion of the maxillary incisors and insufficient lip closure so if you come to the classification given by the ellis and davies it is the class 1 where the crown fracture involving the enamel and the class 2 is the crown fracture without involving the pulp and the class 3 is the crown fracture involving the pulp the class 4 is the traumatized tooth becomes non vital the class 5 is the tooth lost due to the trauma and the class 6 is the fracture of the root with or without the fracture of the crown and the class 7 is the displacement of the tooth without the crown or the root fracture and the class 8 is a fracture of the crown en masse and the class 9 is a fracture of the deciduous tooth so this is the classification which is given by the ellis and davies so if you see how do we examine the traumatic injuries first and foremost we go for the chief complaint of the patient so here the patient should be asked for the pain and other symptoms and they should be listed in the order of the importance to the patient coming to the history of present illness when how where the trauma are significant a trauma to the lips and anterior teeth can cause crown and root or the bone fracture of the anterior teeth without injury to the posterior region another important question to ask is whether the treatment of any kind has given elsewhere for injury before coming to the dental office coming to the medical history the patient should be asked for the allergic reactions and disorders such as the bleeding problems diabetes epilepsy and any current medication if patient is taking coming to the clinical examination the extra oral examination it should be ruled out for any facial bone fractures which may involve the meticulous evaluation of the soft tissues and if you go for the soft tissue examination such as the lips tongue cheek floor of the mouth and the, if in that case the lacerations of the lips and the intraoral soft tissues must be carefully evaluated for any presence of the tooth fragments or any other foreign bodies and the teeth must be checked for proper uh, enamel cracks or the tooth fracture which are involved in the enamel dentin or the cement we should also check for the periodontal status of the tooth so that uh, that the tooth show the response to the percussion in the normal way or it may be tender to the percussion so when evaluating the periodontal ligament this has to be checked and the mobility also should be checked in all the directions next we should go for the vitality test at the initial examination and it should be recorded in comparison with the subsequent other tooth later on we should go for the radiographic examination in the area of the suspected injury and occlusal exposure of the anterior region may show the lateral luxation and the root fracture or the alveolar region and the periapical radiograph can assess the crown as well as the cervical root fractures so that's how the examination of the traumatic injuries will be done
So now we'll go for a condition known as the crown in fraction. It is the incomplete fracture of the enamel without the loss of the tooth structure. This type of injury is very common but often unnoticed. It will result in the uh, fracture to the enamel and appears like a crease line running parallel with the direction of the enamel rods and ending at the DEJ. So, for such cases, the smoothing of the rough edges by the selective grinding of the enamel and uh, uh, smoothing of these rough edges will clear the crease lines. And if suppose there is a fracture of the tooth surface, the composite is needed for the cosmetic procedures. Now we'll see the crown fracture. In such, we have this uncomplicated crown fracture where the crown fracture is involving the enamel and dentin, but pulp is called as uncomplicated crown fracture. And it occurs more frequent when compared to the complicated crown fracture. And this is not associated with the pain. So it does not require any urgent care. So here, uh, this the main objective of this treatment is to protect the pulp by obliterating, obliterating the dentinal tubules. So in case of the enamel fracture, Selective grinding of the incisal edges will be sufficient to remove any sharp edges to prevent the injury to the lips or the tongue. And in such case of the aesthetic reasons, the composite restoration of the uh, tooth can be done. If suppose if the fracture fragment of the crown is available, we can go for the reattachment of the fragment by beveling the enamel and uh, at etching the enamel and placing it in the tooth structure and this uh, technique of uh, compromises the aesthetic because of the internal resin composite which is present now we'll see the complicated crown root fracture in this the crown fracture will be involving the enamel dentin and the pulp that's the reason it's known as the complicated crown fracture. So the extent of the fracture helps to determine the pulp treatment and the restorative needs. So the diagnosis can be made through the pulp testing and taking the radiographs. And the treatment for this is the factors like the extent of the fracture and the stage of the root maturation are helpful for designing the treatment plan for this complicated root fracture. See, in case of these uh, immature teeth, the apexogenesis is preferred because uh, the normal process of the root development will not occur unless the pulp remains alive. So, the pulp produces dentin and if the pulp dies before the apex closes, root wall development will be permanently arrested. So, that should be always kept in the mind. So, the go goal of this treatment is to allow the apex to mature and the dentinal walls to thicken sufficiently to permit the successful root canal therapy. So that's how the pulp survival is very important in case of the complicated root fracture involving the enamel dentin and the pulp in the open apex cases. Okay, now we'll see the pulp capping. The pulp capping implies the placing the dressing directly onto the pulp exposure. So what would be an indication for this is to on a very recent exposure, which is less than 24 hours in a mature permanent teeth with a simple restorative plan. In such cases, after adequate dressing, uh, anesthesia and the rubber dam is placed and the crown and exposed dentin surface is thoroughly rinsed with the saline and followed by the disinfection with 0.12% of the chlorhexidin and the pure calcium hydroxide mixed with the anesthetic solution or the saline is carefully placed over the exposed pulp. And the surrounding enamel is etched and bonded with the composite resin. That's how this uh, pulp capping procedure is done. And the quality of the bacterial tight seal provided by the restoration will give the good prognosis.
now we'll see about the pulp otomy the pulp otomy refers to the coronal extirpation of the vital pulp tissues they are of two types the partial pulp otomy or the full cervical pulp otomy the partial pulp otomy is also known as the sweat pulp otomy which implies the removal of the coronal pulp tissue to the level of the healthy pulp and it's usually indicated in case of the young permanent teeth with incomplete root formation what happens here is that after anesthesia the rubber dam is placed a 1 to 2 mm of deep cavity is prepared into the pulp using a diamond burr and the wet cotton pellet is used to impede the hemorrhage and the thin coating of the calcium hydroxide mixed with a saline solution is placed over it and the access cavity is sealed with a hard setting cement called as irm in the follow up we should have the satisfactory results with the absence of the signs and symptoms and also with the absence of the resorption either internal or external that's how we can say the prognosis is good if you see the cervical pulpotomy it involves the removal of the entire coronal pulp to the level of the root orifices we should always remember the difference between the partial and the deep pulpotomy in the partial we go for the removal of uh, the unhealthy pulp whereas in the cervical we go for the removal of the entire coronal pulp so here what would be an indication for this is that when the gap between the traumatic exposure and the treatment is more than 24 hours or when the pulp is inflamed to a deeper level of the coronal pulp so in this also the same procedure has a partial pulpotomy it involves and the prognosis is determined by the bacterial tight seal of the restoration so now we'll see the case which is related to the pulpotomy that is acute irreversible pulpitis so for this if you see, observe the picture b they have completely removed the coronal pulp and you can see the all the orifices four orifices which have been seen with the hemorrhage so that hemorrhage has to be controlled and the biocompatible material such as the mta will be placed onto the tooth that you can observe in the d picture and later on it is sealed with an irm and in the radiograph you can consequently see the there is no periapical abscess formed even after the follow up and this gives us the successful prognosis of the acute irreversible pulpitis treated with the pulpotomy so next we will see about the apexification so the apexification is in an immature tooth if the pulp tissue is necrotic apexification is the process which stimulates the formation of the calcific barrier across the apex so for this initially all the clear nails are to be disinfected with the sodium hypo to remove any debris and the bacteria from the canal and following this the calcium hydroxide is packed against the apical soft tissue and later back filling with the calcium hydroxide is done to completely obturate the canal so when the completion of this hard tissue is suspected is that is after 3 to 6 months then remove the calcium hydroxide and take the radiograph then we can see the formation of the hard tissue which is satisfactory then the canal is obturated using the softening at aperture see in the picture also we can see the vital pulp therapy which have been done from the left and the right central incisor picture a shows the preoperative radiograph and the picture b shows the calcium hydroxide pulpotomy and the follow up after 3 months followed after 6 months uh, you can see you can see the clear formation of the hard tissue barrier at the apex then you can go for the obturation of the canal with the softened gutta puncture
so that's how this is done now we'll see the crown root fracture the crown root fracture involves the enamel dentin and the cementum with or without the involvement of the pulp and usually it is oblique in nature which involves both the crown and the root this type of injury is considered more complex type of injury because of its great severity and the involvement to the pulp so for this the radiograph has to be taken in different angles to assess the extent of the fractures then how it suppose depending upon the extent of the fracture following should be done while considering the management of the crown root fracture if suppose there is no pulp exposure the fragment can be treated by bonding alone or removal of the coronal tooth structure and then restoring it with the composite if suppose the pulp exposure has been occurred then the pulpotomy or the root canal therapy is indicated depending upon the condition of the tooth if suppose when the remaining tooth structure is adequate for the retention and endodontic therapy and the crown restorations are possible with the help of the crown lengthening procedures so when the root portion is long enough to accommodate the post retained crown then surgical removal of the coronal fragment and the surgical extrusion of the root segment is done and to accommodate a post retained crown and after removal of the crown portion orthodontic extrusion of the root can also be done so when the fr uh, fracture extends below the alveolar crest level surgical repositioning of the tissues by gingivectomy or the osteotomy should be done to expose the level of the fracture and subsequently restore it so that's how the management of this crown root fracture is done now we'll see the root fracture these are uncommon injuries but present a complex healing pattern due to the involvement of the dentin cementum pulp and the periodontal ligament so this fracture usually results from the horizontal impact and the transverse oblique in nature so these are mostly seen in the mature root and most incomplete in the root that is incomplete root formed roots and they are least common in that based on the level of fracture they are classified into the apical third root fracture middle root fracture and the coronal third root fracture so for this if you see how do we examine it see the displacement of the coronal root fracture that is a coronal segment usually reflects the location of the fracture that's the reason the radiographs at varying levels that is 45 to 90 degrees and 110 degrees are mandatory for diagnosing the root fractures so coming to the diagnosis of location of the root fracture first picture you can see palpate in the facial mucosa with one finger and moving the crown with other finger and in the picture from b to d you can see the arc of mobility of the incisal segment of the tooth with the root as the fracture moves incisally the arc of the mobility also increases that's how you have to go for the diagnosis of this root fracture so now we'll see the first and foremost fracture that is apical third fracture in this the prognosis is good if the fracture is at the apical third level provided there is no mobility and the tooth is asymptomatic and in case of to facilitate the pulp and periodontal ligament healing displaced coronal portion should be repositioned accurately and it has to be stabilized with the splinting for 2 to 3 weeks and the tooth is made out of the occlusion if suppose uh, the apical third has vital pulp the prognosis is good but it is uh, the pulp in the coronal third is also vital no so in such cases the tooth has to be made stable with no additional treatment is required if the pulp in the coronal portion is non vital when the root canal therapy of the coronal segment and there is no treatment of the apical segment is suggested and if the tooth fails to recover surgical removal of the apical segment is suggested 
So that's how the Pygelter fracture is managed. Coming to the midroot fractures, it depends upon the mobility of the coronal segment and the location of the fracture line, status of the pulp and the position of the tooth after the fracture. So in that, various treatment options are the root canal therapy for both the coronal and the pygal segment if when they are not separated. And if suppose you can go for the splinting in, in few cases. And the enrontic treatment of the coronal segment only when the apical segment contains the vital pulp. And the apexification procedure of the coronal segment that is the induced heart tissue barrier at the exit of the coronal root canal and the no treatment of the apical segment and other method is to use the MTA for creating the apical barrier in the coronal segment and this is the most commonly used procedure nowadays. And the endurontic implants here are the play an important role by here by the apical portion of the implant replaces the surgically removed apical root segment. If you see the case, that is the root canal treatment of the both apical and the coronal portion is done in case of the root fracture of the 2-1. Here you can see the First, a picture is a preoperative radiograph, then the working length has been taken and the master cone radiograph and the post obturation radiograph. That's how you can go for the management of the middle, mid root fractures. Now we'll go for the management of the coronal third fractures. Here the prognosis is poor because it is difficult to immobilize the tooth. But because of the con constant movement of the tooth, repair also cannot be done. So, if the fracture is at or near the alveolar crust, root extrusion is indicated. Here, the coronal segment is removed and the pygal segment is extruded orthodontically to allow the restoration of the missing crown root tooth structure. That's how the coronal third root fractures can be managed. Now we'll see the healing of the root fractures. Here according to the Andreasen, the root fracture can show the healing in the following ways. That is the healing with the calcified tissues in which the fractured fragments are in close contacts or healing with the interproximal connective tissue in which the radiographically fragments appear separated by the radiolucent line. And healing with the interproximal bone and connective tissue, here the fractured fragments are seen separated by the distinct bony bridge radiographically. And interproximal inflammatory tissue without healing and radiographically shows the widening of the fractured line. That's how this healing of the root fracture is seen. Coming to the luxation injuries, these are cause trauma to the supporting tissues of the teeth ranging from the minor crushing of the periodontal ligament and the neurovascular supply of the pulp to the total displays of the teeth. The first and foremost is the concussion. Here, the tooth is not displaced and the mobility is also not seen and the tooth is tender to the percussion because of and hemorrhage in the periodontal ligament. And the pulp also may respond normal to the testing. Whereas in subluxation, the teeth are sensitive to the percussion and they have the mobility. Here you can see the circular bleeding due to the damage and rupture of the periodontal ligament fibers. So the treatment for this concussion and subluxation is to rule out the root fracture by taking the radiograph and relieve the occlusion by selective grinding of the opposing teeth. Then, Immobilize the injured tooth and enrontic therapy should not be carried out at first because of the both the negative testing results in the crown discoloration which can be reversible. Coming to the prognosis, there is only minimal risk of pulp necrosis and the root resorption. Now we'll see the lateral luxation. Here, the trauma displaces the tooth lingually, buccally, mesially or distally, in other words, out of its normal position away from its long axis. 
Here also you can see the cellular bleeding is present indicating the rupture of the periodontal ligament fibers. Here the tooth is sensitive to the percussion and clinically also the crown of the laterally luxator tooth is usually displaced horizontally with the tooth locked firmly in the new position. In extrusive luxation the tooth is displaced from the socket along its long axis. So the treatment for this lateral and extrusive luxation is that uh, the treatment of the injuries consists of the atraumatic repositioning and fixation of the teeth which prevents excessive movements during the healing. So repositioning the laterally luxated tooth requires the minimal force for repositioning. Before repositioning the laterally luxated tooth anesthesia should be administrated. And the tooth must be dislodged from the labial cortical plate by moving it coronally and then apically. Thus the tooth is first moved coronally out of the buccal plate and the bone then fitted into its original position. That's how it is managed. Coming to the management of this extruded tooth, it is a slow and steady pressure has to be applied to displace the coagulum formed between the root apex and the floor of the socket. After this, the tooth is immobilized and stabilized and splintered for approximately two weeks. For this, local anesthesia is need not needed to give. Coming to the intrusive luxation. The tooth is forced into the socket in an apical direction. So in most cases we can see the damage to the tooth. In other words it results in the maximum damage to the pulp and the supporting structures. So in an immature teeth spontaneous re-eruption is usually seen if re-eruption stops before a normal occlusion is attained orthodontic movement is initiated before the tooth gets ankylized. So that's how it is managed. Now we will see the avulsion or exarticulation or total luxation of the tooth. Here there is a complete displacement of the tooth out of the socket. The common cause would be the direct force sufficient to overcome the bond between the affected tooth and the periodontal ligament within the alar socket. So, what would be the treatment option for this? So, when the patient comes with an avulsed tooth, then the main aim is the reimplantation is to preserve the maximal number of the periodontal ligament cells which have a capability to regenerate and repair the injured root surface. So, uh, for this, uh, when the patient is coming, we, have, we need a storage media for the Avels root. The first and foremost and the most preferred one is the Hunks balanced solution that is a save a tooth. Here the pH preserving the fluid is best used with the trauma reducing suspension apparatus and it is extremely biocompatible uh, with the tooth periodontal ligament cells which keep the cells viable for 24 hours because of its ideal pH and the osmolality. Coming to the next option would be an coconut water. Studies have shown that the electrolyte composition of the coconut water is similar to the intracellular fluid. So this can be used as a storage media for the Avils to tooth. And next is the milk which has shown to maintain the vitality of the periodontal ligament cells for about 3 hours. And milk is relatively bacteria free with the pH and the osmolality compatible with the vital cells. We can go either for the saline which is isotonic and the sterile which can be used as a tooth carrier solution. And if in case of emergency, saliva also keeps the tooth moist. And if you see the management of the avulsed tooth in case of the open apex, uh, it has to be, if suppose it has been immediately replanted, splinted for approximately 2 weeks, 4 weeks or for dry time of greater than 60 minutes and prescribe the antibiotics and have the follow-up for about 7 to 10 days.
if suppose they have kept in an extra oral storage time for about 20 to 60 minutes and then have to go for the storing it in a hung pack salt solution or the milk etc and then soak it in the doxycycline for 5 minutes and then splint it and go for the prescription of the antibiotics but if suppose the extra oral storage time is greater than 60 minutes remove the periodontal ligament place it in a 1.23 percent of the sodium fluoride and splint it approximately and then give the antibiotics but if suppose the management includes the mature pulp with the closed apex in the treatment plan for this has been divided into the three categories based upon the extra oral time which is uh, tooth will be subject so the category one includes the extra oral time of the immediate re, immediately placed at the site of the incident or the extra oral storage time is in the physiological solutions such as milk or hbss for about 15 minutes to six hours then re-implant the tooth and reposition it and obtain the radiograph to verify its position and place it in a flexible uh, place the flexible splint over it and prescribe the antibiotics and assist the tetanus vaccination and provide the post-operative instructions and follow up for 7 to 10 days. And if suppose if it belongs to the category 2, that is 15 to 120 minutes with a wet but non-physiological media and the extra oral storage time is 0 to 60 minutes and it is a dry storage. In such cases, you have to shift the tooth to the Hung's pack solution if available and go for a reposition and replantation and with the flexible spent with the post-operative uh, instructions and systemic antibiotics. Whereas if there is a category 3 that is the greater than 60 minutes of the extra oral time and the dry storage, soak it in the citric acid for 3 minutes and rinse well and debride remove the PDL gently with the sealer and place in a sodium fluoride for 20 minutes and then again replant and reposition and obtain the radiograph and place the flexible splint and prescribe the systemic antibiotics and provide the post-operative instructions. So, with all the possible exceptions of the category 1, all teeth will need the root canal therapy later on. So, that's how the management of the traumatic injuries of each category is done.